Welcome everyone to the second day of the pandemic, science and society. I'm very happy to introduce our first guest today, Dr. David Wang from Washington University School of Medicine. Um, he has been studying viruses for a long time, is an, an expert in zoonotic diseases. Um, I know that you all are, have a lot of questions, so we'll definitely leave time for student questions. And we're gonna go ahead and get started right now. So join me in welcoming Dr. Wang. Take it away, thank you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do today is talk about this broad concept of, uh, several broad concepts, that of emerging infectious diseases and of zoonosis. And to illustrate these, uh, I'm going to use emerging coronaviruses as the exemplars. So to begin with, uh, before we can understand emerging infectious diseases, what existed before that well, was simply infectious diseases. And here is a graph of infectious disease related mortality in the United States from the past century. And what you can see is at the beginning of the 20th century, there was high mortality that steadily declined in large part over the first half century. Um, actually, technically, I'm going to see, is my mouse uh, visible? Okay, so you can see this decreasing slope. And this can be attributed to multiple factors, including increased appreciation for hygiene and sanitation, improved quality of water, um, but also advances such as the advent of antibiotics and eventually of vaccines. And so there was this dramatic reduction in infectious disease mortality, which gave a lot of promise that infectious diseases could in fact, quote unquote, be cured. However, you see this gigantic blip here in this graph, and that should give anyone pause for concern, no matter what the overall trends are. And this particular blip is derived from mortality due to the infamous 1918 Spanish influenza. And so if we know that that can occur at any point in time, uh, unpredictably, then this could happen again at some point in time. And of course, in the middle of the pandemic currently, um, it seems like an obvious thing to say, uh, but there have been people concerned and um, warning about these possibilities for decades, um, most, like, most often associated with fears of influenza because that was the paradigm for uh, a, a pandemic like that. Now, the other nuance to notice in this graph is that in the bottom right here, if you look, this is not flattened or going down, but this is in fact starting to creep back up. And if we zoom in on the last two decades here, what you can see is that there is in fact a steady increase uh, over this period of time of infectious disease mortality. And this could be attributed to a number of uh, infections, including HIV and other quote unquote emerging diseases. And so this is what gave birth to the concept that there are not the original causes of mortality that declined precipitously in the first half of the century, but some other things that are coming out. And so the formal definition of emerging infectious diseases um, was coined in the 1980s uh, by Josh Lederberg and Samuel Morse. And these are infections that newly appear in a population or that have existed and are rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic range. So what are these things? What kinds of diseases are these? Well, there's a many, many of them. And so here is a example. This is a figure taken from a review written almost more than 15 years ago, actually by Tony Fauci, who of course everyone knows today. Um, and so there are many diseases here. Many are viral, some are bacterial. They're all over the world. And these are all the newly emerging infections. So um, <clears throat> the concept of emerging infections has been really important and a lot of attention has been paid to this. Here are two excellent reference materials. These are um, basically booklets that have been written by the National Academy of Sciences. And these depict in great detail a lot of the factors that contribute to the emergence of new diseases. Um, we don't have time today to go through all this in detail. I will touch on very quickly a couple of examples in the context of SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, but I highly recommend these uh, as reading for anyone who's interested in this broad topic. So <clears throat> another key term that I want to define and a, a, a fact is that the majority of emerging viruses are what are referred to as zoonotic. And so zoonosis, the definition is a disease that can be transmitted to humans from animals. And so 
if you think about viruses that have quote unquote emerged, you think of things like HIV, this was transmitted from non-human primates to humans. Um, you think of things like influenzas, and these are typically transmitted from avian species or swine to, to humans. So the, the sort of classic pathogens that you can think about now, these are all following this model of zoonotic disease. So the general concept is illustrated in this cartoon where there's lots of different animal and insect species that harbor a vast array of viruses. And with some frequency, viruses can spill over from one of these animals or insects into humans. And the vast majority of the time this occurs, but the virus infection is not productive at all and the human doesn't even feel it. Sometimes it is productive and the human can become quite ill, but in most cases, that's often the end. So this is what we often what we refer to as a dead end host because it cannot transmit any further. And so an example of this would be something like um, Zika virus. So there was a massive Zika virus outbreak, mosquitoes, bite transmit it, but human to human transmission is, is very, very infrequent and almost non-existent. Um, but in some other rare cases, once it's in the humans, it can be amplified by human to human transmission. And if the human to human transmission is efficient, then this can lead to global spread and potential global pandemic. And so we'll use this little rubric here to um, illustrate some of the examples, um, that specific examples that I will talk about today. Now, obviously the pandemic right now is SARS-CoV-2. Um, so we are gonna talk about coronaviruses and I'm gonna begin with some background about this family of viruses. The name coronavirus stands for crown-like virus and that stems from the crown-like projections from the viral particles that can be visualized by electron microscopy. So this lower right panel is actually the first EM electron micrograph image taken by the CDC during the SARS coronavirus one outbreak in 2003. And you can see there's this sphere with these projections coming out. And so here you have all these other um, artistic renditions of the coronavirus family. So <clears throat> what do we know about coronaviruses? At this point in time, including SARS-CoV-2, we know that there are seven different coronaviruses that infect humans. Viruses in this family can infect many other mammals and birds. These are viruses that we refer to as positive stranded RNA viruses. So RNA, uh, so there are viruses whose genomes are composed of DNA. There are retroviruses like HIV that go through both RNA and DNA stages. And there are those that are exclusively RNA phase. And so coronaviruses are a family of viruses that are exclusively RNA. They are called positive stranded because their genome is the same polarity as messenger RNA. And all that means is that that genome can be immediately translated into proteins to start generating proteins critical for the virus function once it enters the cell. Coronaviruses happen to be rather large. They are about 30 kilobases in length. So they have about 30,000 nucleotides in their genome. And these are among the largest of known RNA viruses. What you see here below is a cartoon depiction of the genome, and this happens to be SARS-CoV-2. The first two thirds of the genome encode proteins that are critical for replication of the virus. The last one third encode a number of proteins that typically form the viral particle. And so some of the proteins you may have heard about in passing or in the press, there's a S or spike protein and N or nucleocapsid protein. These are the proteins that are the most abundant and the most immunogenic. So these are the ones that um, antibody tests typically are testing for, and vaccine candidates are mostly composed of some form of the S or spike protein. So that's just some basic fundamental virology. Now let's talk about the human coronaviruses. So there's seven that we know about today, but the first two, the first two coronaviruses that we identified, that were identified, were discovered in the late 1960s. And these are referred to as Corona 229E and Corona OC43. So what do we know about these viruses? So these generally cause relatively mild self-limited respiratory disease, meaning that the disease basically uh, is handled well by the immune system and there's not very severe disease consequences in most contexts. We know that these are bona fide respiratory pathogens because in the late 1960s, it was possible to do human volunteer challenge studies so there were volunteers who were inoculated with 
uh, samples of human OC43 or 229E and they develop respiratory symptoms. We know these are seasonal. They count for up to five to 10% of all respiratory cases. Um, and they're very common infections in the general population. So seroprevalence, which is a term that defines the percentage of people who have antibodies against these viruses, and you only have antibodies if you've previously been infected. So in the general population, more than 90% of people have antibodies to these viruses. Now, the vast majority of our knowledge of coronaviruses comes from the study of these two viruses because they've been around the longest. But unfortunately, because they're relatively mild, uh, it's fortunate that they're relatively mild, but an unfortunate side consequence of that is there's been very little effort over the past 50 or more years to develop vaccines or therapies due to the relatively mild nature of this disease. So when later new coronaviruses have emerged, there have been no stockpile or arsenal of antivirals or, and not very much experience with developing uh, vaccines against this family of viruses. Okay, so for a long time, there were only these two known human coronaviruses until in 2002, late 2002, marked the emergence of SARS-CoV-1, okay? Of course, at that time, it was just called SARS. It wasn't known, there was no one, and it wasn't even known that it was a coronavirus. So I'm gonna walk through uh, in some detail some of the initial studies of SARS-CoV-1 uh, because it actually is a critical foreshadowing of what happens now. And um, I think it's illustrative of things that we could have learned or should have learned, but perhaps failed to do so, which has led us to be in the predicament that we're in today. So this is the New York Times from March 15th of 2003. And this was when the day the WHO released a global alert warning the whole world about this mysterious severe acute resp respiratory syndrome or SARS that was had affected hundreds of people, primarily in Hong Kong and in the Guangdong province of Southeast China. And so what was known at that point in time was that there was a very high mortality rate, that diagnostic testing for all known respiratory pathogens was negative, and that empirical treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics had no impact on the course of the disease of the affected patients, suggesting that the etiologic agent of this disease was probably a virus, and it was probably a novel virus. So what this led to was a large global effort of many labs, and I was actually fortunate, I was a postdoctoral fellow at UCSF at that time, uh, to collaborate with, U with the US CDC in the effort to identify the causal agent of SARS. And so collectively, these groups came up with a series of data, which I'll summarize on the next slide here, that suggested that the unknown virus that was causing the SARS outbreak was in fact a coronavirus, and specifically a novel one. The types of data that were collected were that first, the virus was able to be grown in mammalian cells. This led to electron microscopy that generated the very diagnostic picture of the spike-like projections from the viral particle that I showed. There were molecular tests, including PCR primers that were specific to coronavirus family that turned up positive. Uh, my specific contribution was that I had developed a panviral microarray. This was a small, a uh, diagnostic tool that had essentially sequences from all known viruses and the most highly conserved sequences from all known viruses. And this gave us a pattern suggestive of coronaviruses that, that, that was present. There was some serological testing that was done that showed that some of the patients who had SARS there could cross react with other known coronaviruses. So then the next step at that point was to sequence the entire genome in order to try and determine how novel or how different this virus was from the other known coronaviruses. Now, you have to remember, this is in early 2003. And a lot of people, when you think of genome sequencing, you've heard the phrase something like next generation sequencing or NGS. And this is an incredibly powerful revolutionary tool. But that technology did not emerge until 2005. And so the, all the efforts to sequence the SARS coronavirus genome relied on classic old school technologies. And nonetheless, even with such quote unquote primitive uh, capabilities, we were able to sequence the complete genome. And with that, we could then compare it to other known coronaviruses. And so the way this is done is um, a phylogenetic analysis is done. So a phylogenetic tree is generated. For those who aren't familiar with this, the 
relationship of any two branches is proportional to the distance between them. So uh, the, the divergence is proportional to the distance between them. So these are all very closely related. So the take home message is if you are on a long branch by yourself, you're highly divergent from known viruses. And in fact, the SARS-CoV branch is out here. It is highly divergent from the other known coronaviruses. Um, the other thing I would want to point out here for sake of comparison is that there's relatively few branches on this particular tree. And that's because in 2003, there weren't actually that many known coronaviruses. So <clears throat> there weren't many known coronaviruses. It was kind of surprised that this mysterious new disease was being, that, was, that had a seemingly high lethality rate was being caused by coronavirus because our whole paradigm was, para, was that coronaviruses only cause mild self-limited disease in humans. Okay, so what, what, why was this important to know it was a coronavirus? So this was March, 2003, late March was identified as a coronavirus. It turned out that the virus had been circulating for the five months previous, but no one knew which, what, what it was. So there was no testing for it. There was only symptomatic um, diagnosis. And of course, there's lots of agents that cause respiratory disease. So once the viral genome was identified, it was then possible to develop diagnostic assays in order to then rule in or rule out whether a patient with a particular set of symptoms did in fact actually have coronavirus or not. And this was critical for knowing in the ultimate containment of the outbreak, who to quarantine and who not to. Um, without such device, you would have to actually quarantine anybody with any kind of set of respiratory symptoms. Okay, so we now know that this was a coronavirus. So where did it come from? And this is where the zoonotic part comes in. So epidemiological studies were done in Southeast Asia, in Southeast China of the first cases. And it was determined that there was a higher disease incidence um, and ultimately higher seropositivity in retrospect once there were antibody tests among exotic animal handlers in this area who worked in the wet markets. So what are wet markets? So wet art markets are these live animal stalls where um, essentially you can think of a farmer's market, but they're full of live animals that are stacked in close proximity on top of each other. And these are sold either directly to customers or to restaurants um, for consumption. And so this led to the suspicion that perhaps the humans working in these animal markets had acquired infection from an animal. And this led to aggressive testing of many of the animals in the wet market. And ultimately two species were found to be positive, civet cats and raccoon dogs. And so here's an example of one of these. Now, once this was found and observed, this led to um, fairly aggressive countermeasures. So this led to um, culling of all of the animals in the market um, of these species. And so here's an example of a picture of people in hazmat suits with piles of carcasses of civet cats and raccoon dogs. Now, in some zoonotic outbreaks, culling the animal reservoir can successfully interrupt the transmission of the virus from the animals to the humans and then end the outbreak. But that depends on humans being inefficient at transmission. And unfortunately, in this instance, this is a fairly efficiently transmitted respiratory pathogen. So culling of the animals had essentially no impact by that point in time on the overall outbreak because there was already sustained human to human transmission. Moreover, it turned out that um, these animals were not actually the natural host of SARS-CoV-1. And the way that was determined is that, as I mentioned, these animals are actually farmed and brought into the markets. And so after the animals in the markets tested positive, they traced back to the original farms where they were produced and there were no SARS positive animals on any of the farms that produced them. And so this led to a hypothesis that these animals must have acquired the infection after arrival in the wet market from some yet other unknown animal host. And so even more testing was done. And this is what finally led to the identification of what is believed to be the true host, natural host of SARS-CoV-1, and that is bats, okay? So ultimately bats were identified to harbor many different coronaviruses and viruses similar to, but not identical to SARS-CoV-1 were identified, but there were so many related viruses found in bats that the model came to be that bats must be the natural reservoir. And so it was only with the post um, SARS-CoV-1 emergence 
that bats became a focal point for virologists. And um, it turns out that bats are incredible reservoirs of many, many, many different viruses, um, most likely including things that you've heard of like Ebola and Marburg virus, to, to name a few. So <clears throat> another question then. So how did this spread so rapidly? Um, and, and I guess I should mention, so remember, this is 2002, 2003, so I realize if you, there's a lot of freshmen here, this is right around the year that you guys are born, so you have obviously no memory of this, uh, and even older students. So, but this is not like antiquity. This is, uh, uh, you know, I'm not that old, but I, I was a postdoc during this period of time. Um, so, so this spread globally around the world in fairly rapid fashion. Um, and so in retrospect and hindsight, looking back, uh, it was discovered that the very first case of SARS-CoV-1 was traced back to the 16th of November in Guangdong. And the, the disease smoldered in Guangdong in Southeast China for about four months, but did not spread beyond that by, by pure chance uh, until on the 21st of February, a doctor from Guangdong who had been treating many of these patients, who himself was ill, traveled to Hong Kong and traveled into, uh, checked into the Metropole Hotel. He stayed one night in this hotel, and then the next day became even more ill and became hospitalized in a hospital in Hong Kong where he ultimately died. So what happened in that one night that he stayed in the Metropole Hotel? So here's a graphic of, of the hotel. Down here is the hallway of the floor he stayed in. This is the elevator lobby. This is from a, a report done in July 2003. So this is about four months after uh, it was published uh, in July 2003. It was done probably in May or June, so two months after the doctor stayed there. They were trying to do an environmental analysis of exposures and transmission in the hotel. And here's what uh, data they generated. Here's a floor plan of the ninth floor, which is the floor he stayed on. He happened to stay in room 911. And what you can see in blue, those are all rooms where the guest who stayed in the room that night ultimately contracted SARS-CoV-1 and became an infection and potentially could then seed, transmit and seed the outbreak. In each room, there you can see two numbers, a numerator and a denominator. The denominator is the number of environmental surface swabs that were tested, and the numerator is the number that were positive. And so none of the swabs in any of the rooms of these infected patients was positive. Now remember, this is done two or three months after they've actually stayed in the hotel. But in red, in this giant oval here and also in the red here are environmental swabs that tested positive. If, I don't know if you can read this, it's four out of 31 here and four out of seven in the elevator lobby. And so what this suggests is that for some reason, when Dr. A stayed in this hotel, there was a massive amount of virus that must have been spread either by coughing or sneezing or vomiting in the elevator lobby and right outside of the room. These other guests, who walked around back and forth through the hotel, uh, through, the, through the hallways and, and took the elevator, somehow became infected. Now remember, this is Hong Kong, which is a very international city with an international hotel. And so these people were from all around the world and they ultimately got back onto planes and they traveled far and wide and disseminated the virus around the world. And so here's the epidemiological met transmission map. So Dr. A traveled from Guangdong to the Hotel Metropole uh, he's patient A, and then B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera. These are all other people who stayed on the floor who became positive, and these wound up seeding outbreaks in other countries like Canada and Singapore and Vietnam, et cetera. And so this is really due to the rapid ability of infected people who are unknowingly infected to travel and carry the virus to other populations. Okay, so the 22nd of February, so, so that night, that 21st of February, that one hotel night was critical. Over the next 10 days or so, these people traveled, they became infected. So by February or March, spread to multiple countries. And this is what led to the WHO global alert. Okay. So SARS-CoV-1, so we know what the virus is. We know where, where, more or less where it came from. We know a lot about how it spread. So how can we stop it? So remember, I told you that there were only two known human coronaviruses before this. There were no vaccines and no antivirals against these. So there was no, no therapeutic interventions that could be taken. And so the only approach was to interrupt transmission. And some of this entailed improved method, uh, containment in hospitals, isolation rooms. 
But ultimately, it came down to very aggressive quarantine and contact tracing, where all infected people who are quarantined, con all their contacts were identified, and they were subjected to 10-day quarantine. And so an example of what happened at this time was that in Toronto, where there was a total of 225 cases, this required about 23,000 contacts to be quarantined. Now, I can tell everybody in this audience, um, I've given this lecture, or this has been part of a lecture for the past 15 years or so. And when you think about in the pre-current situation, if you were to say 20,000 people in St. Louis have to be quarantined for 10 days because of this, you think, well, that's insane, or that's crazy, or how could we possibly do that? So obviously these numbers really pale in comparison because we currently have entire countries locked down and things like that. But, but this was really, really um, unusual and distinctive at that point in time. Okay, now one critical uh, other factor about this was that with SARS-CoV-1, the patients were only infectious when they were symptomatic. And so this is a big difference between SARS-CoV-2 where people can be infected and transmit the virus before there are symptoms. And that makes it much more, much more difficult to effectively uh, contain transmission. Okay. So ultimately, remember this is, uh, it started in November, 2002, identified in March, 2003 as a coronavirus, aggressive contact tracing and, and quarantine implemented. So by the end of July, all the cases were contained and the outbreak was, was over. Now, some people describe the SARS-CoV-1 outbreak as it just went away, and that is completely untrue. It only went away because all the countries that had cases and outbreaks aggressively contact traced and quarantined, and that led to the elimination of, susceptible tr of transmission to susceptible hosts, and that's why it went away. It did not spontaneously disappear on its own. So that's a very important point that I wanna make. Okay, so ultimately what happened? There were about 8,000 confirmed cases and almost 800 fatalities. So this is a case fatality rate of about 10%, which is very high for uh, respiratory virus. Now, the vast majority of disease and mortality was in older patients, patients older than 65, and it was very mild in children. And so this is a parallel that we're seeing with SARS-CoV-2. This is actually very atypical of most respiratory viruses, which tend to affect, affect both ends of the age spectrum severely, very young and the very elderly. Okay. So what are the important lessons that we learned or that we should have learned, but didn't learn from this uh, global outbreak in 2003? So first, this gave, there was the first hint that potentially highly pathogenic coronaviruses could emerge. Again, we only knew about two before. They were relatively benign, so this was kind of a shock. So, but if it happens again now, we shouldn't be shocked. <clears throat> this was the first hint that bats are reservoirs of coronaviruses and many other viruses. This really illustrated the role of wet markets in zoonotic transfer. And what, what is this? This is like an incredible melting pot. You bring together lots of different animal species, each of which carry their own viruses, and you bring them together, stick them in close proximity, and let them just shed on all over each other. And so this is a, a vast opportunity for viral transmission. Quarantine and contact tracing were absolutely critical to interrupting the spread of SARS-CoV-1 and ending the outbreak. There's absolutely a need for more antivirals and vaccines. <clears throat> that any emerging disease can rapidly spread worldwide in this era of jet travel. And to combat this, there needs to be global public health infrastructure and commitment from, from all, all participants in the world because there's no way that any of these diseases is going to be contained to just one country. Did we learn any of these? Well, we can talk about this as in the discussion. Um, Okay, so here was an example. And so we know there were coronaviruses in bats and we know civet cats and raccoon dogs were important in the spillover to humans and human to human transmission was efficient and there was global spread, okay? So SARS-CoV-1 taught us all these things are possible. So uh, I talked about SARS-CoV-1. I talked about how this led to the first discovery of bat coronaviruses. Because of the heightened interest and scrutiny of coronaviruses, two other human coronaviruses were found in 2004. 
And these basically are very similar to these virus in terms of disease spectrum. They cause mild, mild seasonal disease. I'm not going to talk about them anymore. Um, and then there was a brief hiatus until 2012 when the next coronavirus was discovered. And this is MERS coronavirus, which stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. And so what was known and how did this emerge? So just briefly, this was first identified from a case in Saudi Arabia. It's clear that there is a role of camels in the transmission because almost all of the individuals who were infected early um, had some direct interaction with camels. And it has also been identified that bats are probably the ancestral reservoirs. So the coronavirus came from bats, infected camels. Almost all the camels in the Middle East and Northeast Africa are endemic with MERS coronavirus now. And when people have close proximity to the camels, they can get infected. Now, there seems to be highly limited human to human transmission because in most cases, this does not seem to spread from the infected individuals to others, but there are exceptions that have been noted. And in particular, there was one infected traveler who flew to Korea and upon arrival in Korea, ultimately infected other humans leading to a sustained cluster of 185 cases in Korea. Now this is important because South Korea, which seems to be doing very well in the current pandemic, they actually cite their experience with dealing with MERS-CoV-1, uh, sorry, with MERS-CoV in, in, during this transmission event as part of the reason they were more prepared and better able to um, aggressively attack the problem of uh, today's pandemic. Now, what's really critical is with MERS, there's been about 2,500 cases and over 800 deaths. So the case fatality rate of this virus is about 35%. So SARS-CoV-1 was 10% and MERS was 35%. And so it's only by good fortune that this is not effectively human to human transmitted, that we're not having a catastrophic pandemic with massive mortality. Okay. So with MERS, we have the same pieces here, viruses in bats, camels, spill over to humans, but it seems to be largely a dead end. So I haven't blotted this out completely, but there is some very limited amplification, but there has not been essentially global spread. Okay, so that was almost eight, eight years ago. So that takes us now to SARS-CoV-2 and here we are. And so we're having deja vu. So what happened? The earliest known case we reported now was December 1, 2019, of a patient with a mysterious pneumonia in Wuhan. By January 10th, due to improved technologies and sequencing capabilities, an agent was identified, the complete genome sequence, a whole new novel coronavirus was identified. And so in this case, it took about a month between the initial, initial disease symptomology, first cases to identification. In SARS-CoV-1, it took five months. So we gained four months here. This is awesome, right? Technology's improved, we're better at this. The agent turned out to be about 80% identical at the nucleotide level to SARS-CoV-1. That's why they called it SARS-CoV-2. And then, but here we are today, eight months later, we have 21 million cases and 700,000 deaths. Okay, so what do we know about this? So here's a, another phylogenetic tree. It's slightly different uh, shape, but it's the same concept uh, as the one shown before. And I know the writing's very small. You don't need to read anything. Um, shaded in light blue are the known human coronaviruses. These are the four common ones. Down here is MERS. Up here is the SARS-CoV-1. And in red are the genomes of the SARS-CoV-2. And so again, if the distance is short between any two branches, they're fairly similar. And so these, this, this is fairly closely related to SARS-CoV-1. The other thing you'll notice is there's many more elements in this tree than there was before, and this is far from complete. Um, but up here, you see all these, and all these are different bat coronaviruses. And so these are all viruses that were identified post SARS-CoV-1. And SARS-CoV-2 is most closely related to this particular bat virus here, PAT-CoV-RATG13. So this, all this data suggests that bats are probably the natural reservoir of SARS-CoV-2. This bat RATG virus has 96% nucleotide identity, so it's pretty similar. And then there's been a lot of speculation because of the paradigms of MERS and SARS-CoV-1 of, well, 
is there an actual intermediate host that's involved? Or could this virus have actually been transmitted directly from bats to humans? Um, it doesn't seem to have been the case in the previous two examples, but that doesn't mean that couldn't happen here. If there are animals, well, what are they or, or what are the implications? And so early on, there was a suggestion that the Huanan seafood market in Wuhan might be involved, much as the wet market in SARS-CoV-1 was. And there's been other, some reports about something called pangolins. So I'm just going to go over these very briefly. So Huanan market is one of these live animal wet markets. And so here's a, here's a picture. It's a bunch of stalls. Um, here it's cordoned off because it, they, they shut it down. And uh, a number of the original earliest cases had some kind of link. They were either had shopped there or they worked there. So this led to environmental testing. And so there were many surface swabs. Um, almost 10% of the surface swabs tested were positive for SARS-CoV-2. So there definitely was virus there. There's unfortunately no data available about the animals at that time. It's unclear whether they were tested or not. So we don't know about any specific animal. But further detailed analysis determined that um, there were the very earliest cases actually did not have any direct contact with Huanan market. And so that suggests that while the Huanan market may have played a role in amplifying the spread, it probably was not this origin. And so what is that data? So this was from a paper that was published early this year, uh, some of the earliest cases in Wuhan. And you can see that there was this index case of December 1st, um, who did not have any linkage to the Huanan market. And so maybe it was already in the human population and then somehow there was amplification in the market. So this did not shed any light on whether there was an actual intermediate host involved in transmission or not. Okay, the other species or animal that has been discussed a lot, although the jury is still out, has been the pangolin. And what is a pangolin? Here's an image of a pangolin. It's an endangered animal. There's a lot of illegal trade because some parts of it are used uh, in, in medicinal, uh, in traditional medicine. And, um, and so what was interesting is that analysis found SARS-CoV-2-like viruses in pangolins. Here's another phylogenetic tree. The ones with the red dots are the pangolin viruses. Here are the SARS-CoV-2 sequences. So they're pretty similar. They're not as similar as this bat virus at the whole genome level. But again, the reason that there's been some suggestion they might be involved is that there are some small regions of the pangolin coronavirus genome that seem to be more similar than the bat to SARS-CoV-2. And that suggests the possibility that maybe there's some kind of recombination. Um, but all this is still speculation. So there's no clear role of the pangolin that's been um, implicated. Okay, so here we are today then. We have more than 21 million cases of this. Um, and uh, why didn't we do better? Why haven't we been able to contain this? Um, so, so to summarize again, using this, we know there are very similar viruses in bats. Whether they required another intermediate host or not, there was clear spillover to humans. It was amplified. There's efficient human-to-human -human spread, in fact, more efficient than with SARS-CoV-1, and we have global spread. And so SARS-CoV-2 is a zoonotic virus that has spread worldwide. Okay. So I just wanted to sort of summarize here these, you know, the properties of these three different emerging coronaviruses. And um, you know, we went through this in some detail. Obviously, the uh, number of cases of the first two pale in comparison. Um, Fortunately, the overall fatality rate of the SARS-CoV-2, while the, the final numbers yet to be determined, whether it's two or three percent or half a percent or something, it's clearly much lower than what we see with SARS-CoV-1 or MERS. Um, it has clearly spread much farther around the world and more efficiently. The origin of all these, excuse me, appear to be bats. There may be intermediate hosts for this one. Clearly there are. And the key differences are this transmissibility. And that's directly linked to outbreak duration, where the entire SARS-CoV-1 was only nine months. MERS has been ongoing. There's continual spread from camels to humans, but it doesn't seem to go on from human to human. And, and here we are with SARS-CoV-2. So I just want to return because, um, you know, obviously in this course, you're going to talk about all sorts of consequences. And I, I'm sure others are going to talk about interventions and efforts and public health and so on. And, um, we, as a scientific community or global community, um, should not have been taken unaware. Um, 
if you say that it was a complete surprise that this happened, that means we're just ignoring history. Um, it's true, it's never happened with a coronavirus that was this transmissible, but there are other viruses, like the, nine, the 2009 H1N1 influenza, which was very rapidly and efficiently spread worldwide in a matter of like two or three months. So um, there's a lot to learn from the past. Our failure to learn from the past is why we are in the situation that we are now. And in terms of containment and treatment and prevention, we need quarantine and contact tracing. We need antivirals. We need vaccines. We need to recognize the role of travel and we need improved public health infrastructure. So those are hopefully the take home lessons that um, you have from today's talk. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I guess, Krista, you will lead that. Um, yes, exactly. So. so we have a ton of interested students. We have 233 questions so far, and that number is growing. Obviously, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. But um, let me just start with this one. You mentioned early on that we're seeing this increase in emerging infectious diseases since the 1980s or so. And so several questions that the students have revolve around that. Like what would be causing that? Is it just following the increase in population, human population? Or is it related to global travel? Is it related to consumerism? Yesterday we talked a little bit about um, habitat destruction, agricultural systems, climate change. So do you know why we're seeing this increase since the 1980s or so? Yes, so, well, okay, so that, those are great questions. And those two uh, reference books that I pointed out go into great detail, but to summarize, um, there are a lot of factors that include increased population density, um, increased deforestation, uh, increased interaction between humans and animals in places where previously it was non-existent or only very rare. So that increases the chance of spillover. And certainly with more travel, like it used to be that Ebola was only occurring in very remote villages and the outbreaks would be relatively small, dozens or a hundred people. Of course, in 2013 and 14, there was the massive Ebola in, in West Africa, 30,000 people dying and so on. And that has to do with just increased travel, um, increased access and accessibility. So things can spread much more easily. Um, climate change is certainly contributing as, um, as you get warmer, you can just think of simple things like insect vectors can go into new geographic ranges that they didn't before, so people can get infected. Um, so there are a lot of factors, and I encourage everybody, I mean, these are, those are light, quick reading things that um, you can, in even like 20 or 30 minutes, get the gist of a lot of what are the factors that lead to this increasing emergence. Yeah, that's great. And we can link those on our Canvas site as well so that students have access to them. Um, a lot of students had questions about zoonotic diseases, and I, I think some confusion over what they are, but I think you went into that pretty well. So then they started asking things like, are all diseases zoonotic? And how do they affect the non-human animal hosts that they're in compared to humans? Um, what are some of the main transmission modes between non-human animals and humans? And do we see these sorts of uh, emerging infectious diseases coming from our factory farms or from meatpacking situations. Uh, and then and then some actually several questions asking, does that then lead us to think about how we should be promoting plant-based diets? Uh, okay, so that was many, many part question. That's um, right. <laughs> so uh, can we go back to the beginning? Sorry. I, I, yep, yep. So sorry about that. Are, are all diseases ah, genetic? Right. So not all diseases are zoonotic. And so in order for the disease to be zoonotic, it has to be in, in, able to infect multiple hosts, okay? Um, or it might, or it has to at least acquire the ability. It might not naturally. So one example is smallpox, which is a, the only disease that we've ever eradicated. Um, the only known host is humans. There's no animal host of, hum of, of smallpox. It was only in humans. And so if by vaccinating everybody, we were able to eradicate it. And so it seems to be gone altogether. So there are of course, many viruses that have just one single host. And unless they acquire by mutation or recombination, the ability to infect something else, they're not going to be um, zoonotic. Um, so that's the first answer. 
Um, the second part of the question was... Do the, do the animal, the non-human ah, animal host get sick? Right. So that varies. So what's generally believed is that if a virus is naturally equilibrated with its host, it probably doesn't cause very severe disease. Um, and so there's lots of examples of this. So something like uh, rodents carry hantavirus. They don't seem to be negatively affected it. But when hantavirus it spills over into humans, it can be highly fatal to humans. Um, but there are also um, animals that do get affected and it could be their natural host or they could be the intermediate host. And so an example is again, like Ebola virus, which affects not just humans, but other non-human primates. In some non-human primates, it's fine. And then when it spills over into another species, it can also be highly um, uh, pathogenic. So there's a whole spectrum of possibilities. But again, the, the more natural the host, the less likely there is to be severe disease in that host. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, the gorilla populations, for example, have been really negatively impacted by Ebola. Um, right. So then in terms of how the transmission happens and if this could be happening in factory farms or meatpacking mm -hmm. industries, because right, right, right. we do kind of tend to look negatively on you know, the wet markets and, and yet we have our own right, practices. Right, right, right. right. So, um, you know, factory farms lead to very large, high density, um, susceptible populations. And, uh, you know, we're in St. Louis and in the Midwest states north of us, uh, there's like a lot of turkey and poultry farming. And if you followed over the past few years, there have been outbreaks of uh, different kinds of flu that wiped out entire factory farms. Or once there's infection, they wind up having to cull the whole flock because they don't want to spread. And a few years ago, there was even this concern that you know, one year, oh, we're going to have not enough turkeys for Thanksgiving because of this rapid uh, spread. So there certainly are many issues with high density factory farming related to maintenance and control of different uh, infections. A lot of times this leads to prevent bacterial diseases, mass administration of antibiotics, and that chronic use can be a problem too. So there are, of course, there are, there are pros and cons of everything. And so I'm not here to like yeah. criticize farming per se. I'm just from a virus or infectious disease transmission, you're more, gonna have more transmission in high density than low density. So yeah. that's a fact. That, yeah, that's great. And I'm glad you touched on antibiotic resistance because that was another question that had been asked. Um, so is there, is there something about the physical attribute of this virus that we know of that has helped it to be, be more resistant? Or, you know, I mean, obviously that asymptomatic spread is so important as you showed, um, but why is that? Like, why has this coronavirus been able to do that in a way that others haven't? Do we know that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And nobody, I don't think anybody has a defined answer to that. Um, you know, the speculation would simply be, and this is pure speculation, that um, so a virus infection occurs, let's say you get infected, and the virus can replicate to a certain amount before your immune system identifies it and triggers an immune response. And then that's how you know you're sick, right? So, so the symptomology of sneezing and coughing and fever, et cetera, is all your body's response. And so if the virus has some way to delay that by blocking some pathway or so that there, there has to be a higher amount of virus before your body kicks in, then it has a chance to transmit before your body it's completed its life cycle, it's, got, it's producing progeny viruses and they're spreading already before your body immune system has even become aware of it, right? So, so that's one hand-waving kind of explanation. The molecular basis for that and whether that's technically true or not, um, there's, there, there's no clear data on that at this point in time. Okay, good to know. And then you mentioned um, the role of ho hotels for SARS in 2003. Should people be concerned about staying in hotels now? There's several students that asked about that. Um, 
So I guess, again, there's nothing in particular about a hotel per se. It's um, transmission can only occur if you are exposed to virus for, if you're in close proximity to virus. And the longer you are, the more time you spend in close proximity to the virus, the higher the risk, the closer in proximity to you are, the higher the risk. So um, any place where that puts you potentially in close contact for significant amounts of times with any source of virus that you may or may not know about that could be there is a risk. So sitting in a classroom at Wash U for eight hours in one day with a lot of other people or people who have been in the room before, that could be bad. That could be just as bad as being in a hotel. So again, I, I wanna be careful not to like single out any particular um, institution or anything, but, but uh, transmission risk is about exposure yep. and distance and time are the things that, that affect that. Yeah, no, don't worry. We're, we're not gonna say that you badmouthed any particular industry. <laughs> Um, so that's great. Uh, a lot of questions have also been about mutation and to what extent do we need to worry about mutation um, for SARS-CoV-2 and also for the, the ways we're trying to come up with ways to treat it. Right. So mutation is always a concern. And, you know, for different viral families, um, rates of mutations are very different, right? And, and so um, the reason you need a different flu vaccine shot every year is because influenza mutates at a very high rate and your previous year's vaccine is likely to be relatively ineffective against this year's vaccine. Um, and so, of course, we're always worried about that. And I mentioned in the beginning of the talk that the virus, this is an RNA virus and RNA viruses tend to have higher mutation rates than DNA viruses. So, of course, we should be highly cognizant and aware of potential for mutation in this particular virus. But as a generalization, the coronaviruses tend to have lower rates of mutation than the flu viruses. And this can be evaluated when you look at these seasonal, the, like the original ones that we know about, this corona OC43 and 229E. They haven't changed a tremendous amount in the 50 years that we know it as compared to flu. And so if SARS-CoV-2 is gonna follow the paradigm of its family, it's probably not going to mutate a tremendous amount. Um, that doesn't say that those mutations couldn't be important. Like one single point mutation could alter its pathogenicity. It could alter its transmissibility. Um, a concern that people have is as we develop vaccines, if the virus mutates in the region of the protein that's used for the vaccine, could then the virus now escape the immune response that's vaccine induced? So these are all legitimate concerns that I think everybody has to think about and, and certainly are, um, are considerations. Definitely. Um, and so I think that relates to, to two questions. I'll ask them separately, though. Uh, so some students had questions about, like, are RNA viruses more dangerous or are bigger viruses more dangerous? Are there certain things that make viruses like standards that make certain viruses more dangerous or does it just depend? It all depends. So, so uh, there, I would say that there is no correlation between type of virus, meaning DNA or RNA and dangerousness um, and whether it's a large virus or small virus because um, so, you know, one of the most lethal viruses uh, is Ebola, right? And that's a, that's a small smallish, medium-sized RNA virus, but smallpox is a very large DNA virus, and smallpox has, you know, high pathogenicity, very severe disease. Uh, and then there are lots of viruses of both flavors that are relatively mild and cause, like, the mild sniffles or something like that. So um, I don't, I wouldn't generalize in terms of virus size or type of virus genome and, uh, and disease potential. Okay. Do you think that having been exposed previously to any of the previous coronaviruses has any impact on the body's response to this new one? Yeah. Okay. So that's a really important question that is being heavily, heavily studied by many scientists right now. And um, 
the, the most relevant previous exposure would, of course, be with SARS-CoV-1, which is the most closely related. But we know that there, that infection was limited to about less than 10,000 people around the world. Yeah, and the number of people who are still alive today who, who have that, um, that's probably relatively insignificant. Um, but what has been fortunate is that there were blood samples and antibodies that had been studied from SARS-CoV-1 patients. And some of those show to be effective at blocking SARS-CoV-2. The more important question probably is whether any of these common coronaviruses that infect the vast majority of the worldwide population, whether infection with those has, caused, has, has produced any kind of um, immunity or effect. And what's known in the laboratory is that there are some cross-reactive antibodies that seem to exist. And so whether those, how much those contribute, we don't know. It could be that this is just theoretical now. It could be that some people who have more of those cross-reactive antibodies, maybe those are the people who are asymptomatic, because we know there's a lot of asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 patients. Um, but that's just speculation. Um, then there's other studies. So of course, antibodies are important, but there's also T cells. And there have been a number of recent papers that suggest that um, infection with these seasonal coronaviruses may have uh, produce cross-protective um, T cells. And again, maybe those, if you have those, maybe that's why the difference between being a mild versus a severe case or being asymptomatic and mild. Um, but there's not enough data yet to really know exactly what the situation is. Um, so, so it's still an open question. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, thank you so much. This has been really incredible. I feel like you've given us all a great background um, that will help us as we move forward in this course. So I just want to ask you one last quick question is, as, as we're all trying to do better, and given that you have so much um, experience working with these types of viruses, is there anything that you recommend or suggestions, words of wisdom for us um, as we go through our day-to-day -day lives here? Um, you know, I think that the thing that we can do as individual citizens that's going to help the most is adhere as much as possible to social distancing, masking, every, anything to minimize the spread. Because the biggest problem is that people have to do this for the communal good, right? Um, if you go to a party and there's a lot more cases now, maybe none of the kids die because they're healthy, but the sustained transmission then leads to another round of infection to other people and the domino effects. And you know, with appropriate epidemiology, we could trace everything back, right? Um, just like in the, the Dr. A uh, Metropole Hotel. And like, uh, you know, the last thing you want is like, gosh, you know, some 70 year old person died because they got exposed by their grandchild who went to this party or whatever. And, and, um, and it can be more steps removed. We just don't know. And so we all have to do our part to reduce transmission and that helps everyone. Um, and, and I think that that's the thing that every person can do regardless of what you know or don't know about the virus. Like reducing transmission will reduce disease. That's, that's, that's just an absolute fact. There's no, there's no, there's no subjectivity to that. So yeah. that's what I have to say. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, and the students, there's now over 700 questions in the question okay. box. So we will, we'll try and get their questions answered in our discussion boards on Canvas. But obviously, everyone loved this presentation. It was really incredible. And I just want to say thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. All right. Absolutely. Okay, have a good Bye -bye. day. Bye. I think we're going, if, yeah, if you can stop sharing yeah, your screen. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so we have a few minutes before our next speaker. Um, and I think he should be here any minute now, except for he's having trouble getting into Zoom. So I'm saying this out loud to our IT staff so that they can help with that. And for all the students, if you can just Hang tight for one second. Um,
Thank you for your patience. Um, I want to just, I'm going to go ahead and answer. Oh, here we go. Good. Great. Hello. Welcome. Sorry about Hello. that. Sorry, it was the, the Zoom details were different than I'm used to. I yeah. No, it's no problem. I, I, we're, we're in a technology um, strange land here where we have so many students interested in this course. So we're just trying to keep, keep on it. But thank you so much for being here. And I'm glad that the Zoom, work link, Zoom link worked out. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to present Dr. Jose Jimenez, who is coming to us from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and he's going to be talking about aerosol transmission of COVID-19. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, and I, I'm going to try to keep it short so that there is time for a lot of questions. This is a confusing topic, I know. Um, so anyway, I'm going to share my screen Let's see here so you can see some slides. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides now? You can, okay. Okay, and I will, I will give Chris a copy of the slides with, which has all the links and everything so you guys don't have to try to write the YouTube links or anything like that. Okay, so uh, I think probably you've, you've read many, most of you have read many articles about this, um, but basically there is, there is three modes of transmission and actually let me, I'm gonna move this to this screen otherwise you're gonna see me sideways. Okay. Second, um, oh, okay. um, there is three modes of transmission um, of, of this respiratory diseases like this one. So one of them is, is what we call the fomites or through surfaces. So you shake someone's hand or you touch your infected, you touch your nose and then you touch a light switch and then that surface has a virus and then um, someone else touches it and then they, they touch their nose and they get sick that way. Um, there is quite a bit of evidence that this is real. This happens for this virus. There is also quite a bit of evidence and the CDC agrees now that this is not major. I mean, what, what we think is something like maybe 15 or 20% of transmission happens this way, right? Through these surfaces. We should still wash our hands, we should be careful, we shouldn't shake hands, but it's not the main way this disease transmits. So everyone agrees that it's going, it's being transmitted through the air in one or two ways. And, and the, there's more debate about which one of the ways is more important. Um, one is uh, basically, I mean, these are the two situations where that happens. One is when you're close to someone, and then when you're close to someone, you are exhaling, uh, we're always exhaling what we call respiratory particles, which are little bits of your saliva, or the respiratory lines, lungs, trachea, and when we breathe, this is known from a long time, there are little, little bits of this fluid or the saliva that come out. And if you happen to be infected, there are viruses in there for, for these respiratory viruses, right? And these particles, they can do one or two things. One is what they call the, the droplets, the ballistic droplets, and I call them angry birds, like in the game. They come out of you, you're talking, and zzzz, they land on someone else. They land on their eyes and then there are a lot of virus. If they land on your eyes or you, on your nostrils or your mouth, you can get infected that way. And nobody disputes that. The other way is that maybe it's smaller and they're small enough that it can float in the air. They can float in the air and be immediately breathed in by someone else, or it can float in the air in the room and be breathed in sometime later. That's kind of what we call the aerosol pathway, right? And, um, and there is a lot of debate between these two, okay? And, and I, if you look, see me uh, criticizing WHO because they say that these droplets are more important and I think they're totally wrong. And uh, I won't go into, into details about that, but I'll just say, you know, I think the evidence is overwhelming that aerosols are probably the majority. And I think if not the majority is certainly important, right? And this is, so the aerosols can infect you in this or in this situation, right? When you are close to someone or when you are more of a distance, right? And once the virus finds some surface in your nose or in your lungs, then it kind of replicating and you're infected. Um, and this is, this is a cartoon that's from the WHO webpage in which you know there are these droplets coming out of someone, this is just steel, but basically the droplets are falling 
in, in WHO world, they fall in one meter. In CDC world, they, they fall in two meters. Basically, some, some distance. And then, you know, then they contaminate the surface. So if you touch it, you could get infected that way. But, but basically, if you're in the same room and you're far away, and you take care of wash your hands and you keep your distance, you're totally safe. Right? That's the... And, you know, then we, like people like myself who have investigated like the choir event in which, uh, you know, 53 people got infected and they were not all 53 within a meter or two of, of the person who was sick, you know. So it's clear that, you know, there can also be this smoke that floats in the air and can get this person sick, right, as a aerosol pathway. Um, to, this is a, a better cartoon. Um, of the same thing, which has a little more detail, right? So here you have the, the person who's sick and the person who is, uh, who can get sick. And here you have kind of this ballistic drop, the angry bird that can hit him on the eye, get him sick that way. And then there are also all these aerosols coming out and again, it's like a smoke. And the smoke is not ballistic, it's much more chaotic and depends what's going on. We have the, the experience of that. I mean, people my age, we talk about cigarette smoke, I'm told for people your age, is more vaping smoke, but they behave in the same way, right? And then, you know, some of them, if they're heavier, they float in the air, but they're gonna fall. And then many of them are gonna stay in the air, right? And then if they enter um, the person, you know, and they can be deposited in, in the nose and the lungs, that's what initiates infection, right? And this is why masks uh, work so well, right? Because they, they prevent these ballistic droplets from coming out. If they come out, they prevent them from landing in this area. And they also prevent these aerosols from coming out and they prevent them from being breathed in. Okay, and I'll say a little more about masks. One thing that, that, uh, that will become clear as well is that, um, you know, if a droplet somehow escapes this person because it's not wearing the mask very well, the eyes here are not protected, right? And we do know it's, it's again, it's, it's not controversial that you can get infected through the eyes, right? So we recommend, a lot of people recommend to wear some eye protection, like some kind of, you know, if you're gonna be in places where a lot of other people are, like some kind of use safety glasses. Like there is these safety glasses that are like $15, like ski goggles that are pretty close around your eyes, but they don't need to be expensive. And, um, and that's a good protection. If not, regular glasses also offer some protection, right? Okay. So now uh, an, an aerosol again is used a solid or a liquid that's suspended in air. Okay. So now, um, what to give you a sense of a scale and I'm, I'm told you guys have a very wide range of backgrounds right so then let me give you the aerosols 101 very briefly and i'm sorry i couldn't i didn't find the, the slide on time but i'll try to do it with my hands so what's the air made of so things like nitrogen and oxygen and co2 these are gases right they, they have a size of about 0.1 nanometers and they they are separated by a distance as much larger than their size. Most of the space is empty and they kind of collide with others. Some of you may have seen kinetic theory and they're, they're doing their thing, right? And there are also some contaminants like ozone and that people like me study a lot and many people at uh, WASU as well. These aerosols, these particles are much bigger. So the typical aerosol may have a million molecules all stuck together. It's like a little bit of water or a little bit of saliva. And all these molecules like in a liquid or a solid are not separated by a distance as much larger than them, but they're all kind of touching each other, right? And then you have a million molecules all clumped together and that's another, so, right? So then um, it's a solid or liquid suspended in there, but it's big enough that it can carry a virus, but it's small enough that it can stay in the air for an hour or two, right? So we say, you know, an aerosol is whatever solid or liquid suspended in there, that includes a cow in a hurricane. Right. That's also an aerosol, technically. Um, okay, so then one thing that um, I thought this has been pressed a lot, but a lot of the visualizations are wrong. So this is from, from a press article and they had there these droplets or these aerosols really. And you know, you see, for example, this one here, in which uh, you know, the virus we know is about 0.1 microns or 100 nanometers in diameter. So these droplets or this aerosol will be maybe two or 300 nanometers in diameter, right? But that's not really what's going on. What we think is more realistic is this, that you have aerosols that are more like three microns. So there is still, for a scale, a human hair is 80 microns in diameter. So you see this is very small, still invisible, but it's much bigger than the virus. And the virus, you know, there's maybe a few viruses in, in, that, in that aerosol, but most of the aerosol is not the virus, it's like if it's, is maybe saliva or is 
if it's your respiratory fluid, most of the aerosol is mucin, which is the protein that lines um, our lungs, and sodium chloride, like salt, and some water and things like that. And then there is a, some viruses sprinkled in. That's kind of what we're talking about. And when you're trying to filter the air or clean the air, you have to remove this big, this big hunky particle and not the virus. The, the scale is like, if the virus is the size of a squirrel, the particles that carry the virus are the size of an elephant. Okay? And the elephant is much clumsier than the squirrel. And if it encounters a filter, it's much easier to get rid of it. Okay? That's, that's one reason why masks work so well when people who think the mask is the size of the virus get very confused. Okay? So now going closer to, to this estimator. And I know I'm going quickly, but, but uh, hopefully there'll be questions where I can, I can uh, and maybe Krista, you can curate the questions and uh, uh, see which ones I should answer first. So, so we have, when aerosols can infect you, they can infect you in one of three ways. One is, so you have someone smoking, and again here the smoke is not that the smoke carries the virus, but is that the smoke allows us to see what aerosols because the respiratory between to see them, right? So if you're talking, I'm pointing to the wrong screen. If, if I'm pointing to this person here, I'm talking to this person here, I will breathe a lot of their exhaled air with little dilution, right? And then I can get infected faster. According to the CDC, if you do this for 15 minutes in a party, that's a problem, right? Now, uh, let's say you keep your distance, which, which is a very good idea to do. But you're in a room that has low ventilation and the smoke builds up over time. Right? If you, and you stay in that room for two hours or two and a half hours like in the choir, you can also get infected that way. And this is what we think happens in a lot of these super spreading events. Right? I was looking at data from uh, Louisiana that they released on contact tracing data and they said they had, they had had recently 41 outbreaks in bars and on average each outbreak infected 11 new people. And it's like, it's hard to imagine that someone in a bar has spent 15 minutes talking closely with 11 other people in all 41 bars. I think it's, it's much easier to explain per Occam's razor that it is more of this kind of situation, right? There is also something that, that's called long range transmission, which is for example, um, and this happens for some diseases like for missiles. If, if for example, I have missiles and I am talking in this room like I'm talking to you and then I leave, someone else comes into this uh, room three hours later, they can get infected. This has been shown um, because missiles is just spectacularly contagious, you know, but COVID-19 is not like that. And there are no cases I'm aware of that, that have shown that kind of infection. It's really, you have to help it along. You have to talk to someone really close or you have to stay in the room and share the air for a long time in order to get infected. But unfortunately enough people are doing that uh, that the disease uh, progresses, right? Um, now, I, I thought I would say something about masks. And um, you can think, you know, you think about these droplets or these aerosols and they, the mask means different things. If you, you know, if basically you have these angry birds coming at you, all you need is a parapet. You, you wear some kind of mask and some eye protection and then whatever is coming to you, they stop and you're protected. If you're trying not to breathe in the smoke, you need a better mask. You need something that doesn't have gaps, right? So you have your mask. You, don't, you shouldn't be able to put your finger around. If there is a gap, the air, like everybody, is gonna go where it takes the least effort. So it's gonna go all through the holes, right? So then this is from a video that's here. And when you get the slides, you can click on it and see it is actually highly recommended from a colleague in the Netherlands. And they tested, you just put a mannequin and this mannequin is breathing out an aerosol. So we can see it, right? And with some lasers, they visualize it. And they see different types of masks and they see that actually more than the type of mask, what matters is how well fit the mask is. So this is a surgi surgical mask, which is pretty good, but it's not fitting well. And you see all this smoke that escapes. And especially it escapes behind the person. If, you, if there is a person that's not wearing their mask well and you see gaps, don't stand behind. That's the dangerous place, stand in front. Okay? Now this is a KN95, the nominal is better, and it's hard to see here, but there's also some smoke escaping, right? And this is a cloth mask, but what you see is that it's better built and it closes very well. And when you're watching the video, you don't see any aerosols, okay? So mask fit is very important, as much or more as the, as the mask type. And yeah, don't, don't stay behind uh, someone who has a poorly fitting mask. And something else that's very important is when we breathe, we exhale these respiratory particles and we exhale the virus if we're infected. But when we talk, 
that's 10 times more. Why? Because our vocal cords are vibrating. They are wet and, they're, and then that process is making, is making more aerosols. If we yell, we shout, or if we sing, then it's 50 times more, right? So then if you have a group of people, you know, so like we see the politicians on TV or even Anthony Fauci, he goes to Congress, he wears his mask, and now he's gonna talk, he removes the mask. They're like, no, that's the opposite that he should do, you know? The person who's talking in, a, in an enclosed space is the person that needs to, needs to wear the mask, you know? And this is why, you know, especially, maybe if we have time, we'll, we'll simulate a party, a university party, which is, you know, if you are watching what's happening in UNC, that's how they are all getting infected, right? And you will see that the, the chances of infection are very high. Uh, let's see what I was saying. Okay. So I'm almost done with this part. And maybe then we can take questions and then we can go to the spreadsheet. Um, so what is this spreadsheet? And depending on your familiarity with the spreadsheet, this may look not too complicated or, or the most confusing thing you've ever seen. But basically, it, it shouldn't be too confusing. What we're trying to, to model mathematically is, let's imagine we have a room. And let's imagine that the smoke or the virus is coming from an infected person into the room. Okay? And then, you know, if nothing happened, if this was, you know, like the CO2 or something, it would accumulate in the room. And if there was no ventilation, it would just build up. It will accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. Now, it doesn't keep, and then this person that's there that's susceptible would breathe that in. That's not quite true because of three things. One, in any room, no matter how tight, there is always some, some leakage of air that comes in and, and goes out. And the air that comes in, if it comes from the outdoors, is clean and doesn't have the virus. And it takes the air that has the virus out. So that limits how much virus will accumulate. Also, the virus doesn't live forever in the aerosol. There is some debate, but it's only like an hour. After an hour, it's no longer capable of infecting, right? So you have to breathe that, that virus within an hour. For measles or for tuberculosis, those are much hardier. They survive much longer in the air and it's a reason they're more infected, right? And also the virus is on these big chunky particles, these elephants, who stay in the air and can be breathed in, but not forever. They're settling slowly with gravity and in an hour or a couple of hours, they will end up in the ground, okay? So this is why, so this basically you can imagine, this is like if you had a sink and, and the level of virus is the amount of, of water in the sink, right? And the amount of, of virus that people are breathing in is how much water is coming in. And then these three sinks are three holes. These three, these three loss processes of the virus are three holes in the sink. If they're big, then more virus will, uh, will, will go down. And the level of virus in the room will be low. If they're small, if there is low ventilation and it's cold and the virus survives longer, then the level of the virus will be high. And for spending the same time in this room, it will be more dangerous. So that's, that's what the model is doing mathematically. And it's, this is a sim relatively simple model for indoor aerial atmospheric chemistry, it's similar how we model radon. Some of you may have heard, which is a radioactive pollutant and it's very, very similar, right? In that case, instead of dying, it decays radioactively and it's also ventilated. But anyway, and then, so what do we need to know? We need to know how big the room is, how many people are infected, how many people can get sick, at which rate is the air being ventilated, how quickly is the virus dying? So those are all the numbers you enter and then the model does the calculation for you. Okay? And we are assuming that once this person breathes it in, it's like you had a fan, it's mixing it in the whole room very quickly. We assume that because, because the risk doesn't change very much on average if you do it in other ways and because that's by far the easier, right? You probably have seen videos where you see kind of the, the particles come in and then they go around the room and whatever, and that is true, but that depends completely on what's going on in a specific room, right? And, and that's not possible to, to capture in a simple model like that. But, but, it is, um, but it is something that happens. And if you care a lot about a specific room, I would say, go there and do the experiment, light some matches and see what happens with the smoke. Or go do some vaping and, and that will tell you what the air is doing. You know, it's basically this visualization experiment. Uh, the last thing I would say uh, is using CO2 as an analog. Okay? So we breathe out the virus. So here we have the infector and it's breathing out the virus, which is this particle that has the virus in it. And then that can be lost, can be filtered, can go outside or can die. But every, every time when we breathe out the virus, we also breathe out CO2, right? And CO2 is inert, right? There is a background in the atmosphere of 415 parts per million, more or less now. And that CO2 that's outdoors is what we worry for climate change, which is a big problem. And I could give another lecture on that in, in a future year but we won't talk about that today. But 
for us, that's a background. And then when we brief, you know, all the food we eat, the energy we use ends up as CO2 and we breathe it in the room. And then that will increase the concentration in the room. And right now I have a meter, I don't know where I, where I put it, but probably right now I'm talking a lot, it's probably a thousand part per million, right? And if you are in a room that has low ventilation in a classroom, it may be three or 4,000 part per million. And if you are in a room that has very good ventilation that has the windows open, it may be 500 parts per million. And the virus goes proportionally with that. And you can imagine that you want to be in a place that is 500 and not 3,000, right? And, um, and I have a Medium post that I, I will link here before I send the, the slides to Krista, where it's actually not, not very hard. There are these analyzers that you can buy that cost $100, connect with your cell phone, take data every minute, and you can go to the supermarket, you can go to your classroom, you can go anywhere and get a sense of the ventilation and which are high risk versus low risk places and which places need, uh, need work. And I'm trying to turn everybody into citizen activists. Okay? And yeah, $150 is some cost, but share it with your friends, share it with your school. You know? it's, and then it's, it is really extraordinarily useful. Okay? There is more details you know, at the research level that we're writing papers about, but to first order, it is true and everyone agrees that the more CO2, the riskier it is. Okay? So let, let, me, let me take questions now and then we can go on to the, to the estimator. And I'm gonna close the, the door because people are turning on the microwave, so. <laughs> okay, that was excellent. Thank you very much. So I, I just wanna say, um, you know, you started by mentioning how your, what you're advocating for is different than what we're hearing from other um, sources. And I mean, you are not alone in this, right? You are one of many very talented scientists who are part of a consortium that are trying to make sure that we understand that the spread is more serious than we realize. The, the, the spread through aerosols in particular. I mean, I think the, um, um, and this is, um, I probably shouldn't go into the history in the interest of time, but it's a very interesting history in the history of medicine and infectious diseases, why it has become accepted for a hundred years that it is very difficult that diseases are transmitted through aerosols, right? And then, so, and this, this thinking totally dominates WHO, CDC, they all come from this paradigm. And then, but then together with 239 other scientists, we sign a letter to WHO and we've been talking to WHO trying to convince them that they are totally wrong. And we believe, I mean, I'm certain, I, you know, I, I hadn't worked on this field. So then when I started, you know, someone asked me to volunteer to help on this. So I said, okay, and I was learning and I, people were saying things and I was like, oh, huh, really? But as I learn more about it, it's like, no, I'm absolutely 101% convinced that WHO and CDC are totally wrong. And this is an aerosol driven disease, right? I think they will, they accept that maybe if it's low ventilation, so they're starting to move in this direction, all the evidence in favor and against. And I, I've been using Twitter extensively as a way in a way a market research because you can find all the scientists and tell them why do you believe these droplets are doing the contagion and then you realize that they don't have anything yeah. to offer that this is just something they believe it's a dogma absolutely you know? well you have about 1300 more advocates to work for you because they're all assigned um, to be spreading the information that they learn in this class so hopefully they'll take well, to social media and spread your message well well they, I think they they, should, they shouldn't believe me either <laughs> they should <laughs> They should investigate. Go to the, go to the evidence. Go to what I've written in Twitter. But go to the, what the WHO says. Go to and and make up your mind. That's that's the better message, you know. Because because uh, if if people don't think that's a problem, right? I mean, I I'm convinced on what I'm saying, but I could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong, but I could be wrong, right? So you yeah. always want to encourage people to think. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I'm glad you gave that history because some of the questions were about why are they sticking with this paradigm and that sort of thing, as well as kind of how you got into this from your previous work with pollutants. Um, so I think that's great. I, a lot of the questions are about masks. And since, you know, your both your estimator information and what you talked about today um, talks about this leakage, kind of wondering about what sort of mask do you recommend? There's been some new information out now that the gator style or gator style or bandanas aren't very good to wear. Um, obviously, you showed the fit of the N95, which is why that's kind of the standard, right? Because it's so well fit. What sort of masks do you recommend people wear? If it is well fit, so so this is a KN95, which is like close, similar to the N95, but it still has more leakage than a cloth mask, oh. right? So then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, I mean, in this case, 
I mean, I have to say, is not that you cannot fit it well, is that when they did this experiment, I think on purpose, they didn't fit it very well. So that people will learn that it's not that just having an N95 and putting it there it doesn't help you. You have to you have to work at it, right? So then, I mean, um, I have all the types of masks. And no, no, normally, when I go outside, I, I I wear a surgical mask and use, but but I work at having it better fit, or or some cloth mask. I also have some N95s that are less comfortable. And the thing with the N95s is they're more rigid. And you really, the devil is in the details. The devil is in the gaps, right? And if you have a tiny gap, a lot of air can go through there, right? So, so in a way, something like this, in which yeah, it's not it's not so tight, but it extends further in your face. You see, here the mask ends here and here. Instead of there, you have much more length of mask. So it's not a seal like it's pushing against your skin, but it's a much a higher length. I think a good cloth mask can seal well, and. Um, I mean, people, you know, for this N95 and kind of thing, there is people who, for the battlefield, if the enemy sprays anthrax or something, so they, they test these things very well, but you have to really work hard to, to test this mask to make sure you don't have any gaps. And people who've done it say it's, it's a lot of work, right? So what I would say is that, that uh, you know, for the general population, we just don't have the capacity of protecting but we can protect us just paying attention to the face, right? I mean, when I go outside and I see a lot of people wearing masks poorly, it's not that any of that is hard to fix, it's that they haven't paid any attention, right? But but basically, for example, with these ones that go behind the ear, so my son or this kind, for my son, they are a little too loose. So then we make a knot here, so it's a little tighter, or or you make sure that the metal that's here fits well, or you, or you if the one is too small, you find one that fits you better and whatever, and, and you just spend time in the mirror and with your mom, with your girlfriend or whatever, just, making sure that, that nobody can put a finger in your gaps. That you, and that, that can, honestly, I think in the real world, that's more important. That will work better if people paid attention to that than giving everyone N95s. Because then you see people with N95 and it's kind of hanging a centimeter away from their face. And it's like, you know, this, this is... Also, let's be honest, they're not very comfortable. So yeah, we might as well right. use the cloth ones. So that's great. Yeah, OK. So everybody should spend some time in the mirror making sure they have a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, and then do you recommend that even if someone's six feet away, uh, even if they're outside, that they're getting in the habit of always wearing a mask and eye protection? Um, I think in, indoors, yes. If you're indoors with others, they could be infected by all means. Outdoors, I think it depends. If you are outdoors in New York City and it's really crowded and it's like it's almost like you're in a demonstration, I say, I say yes, yeah, especially the mask and the air protection is a good idea. If you're on the beach and the next person is 20 feet away and it's windy, I mean, I think, yeah, this, I, you know, and, and uh, any of the, you know, the problem, you know, we see our society and and, uh, and each of us is having a hard time with all these restrictions, right? So we have to put our energy where the restrictions are to, you know, if we are wearing a mask at all times, we're gonna get so tired that then by the time we go into the shop after being on the beach with the mask, then it's gonna be fitting well, you know. So I would say, you know, this, go in open air is very safe. It's clear that um, if you are open air and away from others, nobody has gotten sick. You know, in the millions of cases there are, there's not a single documented case. There is cases in which people have gotten sick outdoors when they were talking to each other very closely for a long time and it probably wasn't windy, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are talking to it, to someone else for a long time outdoors and you're close, basically if they are smoking and you would smell a lot of smoke outdoors because it's a quiet day, whatever, then wear the mask. You know, if, if you're on the beach and there is someone 30 feet away and they're smoking, you know, that's, that's, especially if it's windy, then that's, that's, not, uh, that's not important, right? I mean, it's also I that, you know, I, I tend to be more on the paranoid side, but, but I think it's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think no. that's just my personality, yeah, not, not, a, not an assessment of the risk. <laughs> no, I think that's great. I, I, I've taken, just because it's made it easier to get in the habit, I've taken to just wearing dog masks, dog, dog masks. I've been taken to wearing masks on my dog walks in the park every day because I'm constantly <laughs> passing people. And, you know, it's pretty, yeah. fortunately, I live close to a really beautiful park here in St. Louis, but it's very crowded. Um, yeah, so then I'm assuming from what you've said, some of the students asked about things like indoor dining. I'm assuming you would not recommend indoor dining at a restaurant right now. And then they're a little bit worried, you know, as, as students are going back to universities, 
what does this mean for the dorms? Like at WashU, for example, they're all being housed individually in their own dorm rooms. Do they need to be worrying about the ventilation systems and those sorts of things? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, I think what we're, I mean, outdoors is, the, of the things you can do to be safe, outdoors is the best by far, by, by a factor of 10 or 100, you know. So anything that can be done outdoors, do outdoors. I mean, what I've been advocating, I mean, in New York 100 years ago, there was a lot of tuberculosis and they realized that being outdoors, people didn't get sick. So they had a school, there's an article in New York Times two weeks ago, where they did a school outdoors in New York in the winter. And you see all the kids there next to the Hudson River wearing these three coats one on top of each other, but it worked, you know. So if they, if they could do it there, we can do it now, you know, at yeah. least some days, whatever. So anything that can be done outdoors, do outdoors. Then if you have to go indoors, you know, so limit, limit. So you want as few people as possible for as short as possible, always wearing masks, try to avoid shouting or singing and talking as less possible. And, and then you have to pay attention to, to ventilation or filtration, right? which are the things that remove the virus from the air. None of those things are a silver bullet. Okay? And I, maybe I'll show you um, with the estimator. So this is, a, this is the case in which we have the Skagit choir where 80 some percent of the people got sick. This is how many people got sick in the real event. And now once we have the model, we know this happened through aerosols. Once we have the model, we can do different, oh sorry, I'm looking at the right screen. This is a real event. And then this is when we do different things. Now let's say we, they had low ventilation, we think. Now we increase the ventilation. So instead of 83%, now 55% get infected. Now we add an air cleaner. We, we go back to the ventilation of the real event, but we add an air cleaner, similar benefit. Now we go back to the real event, remove the ventilation, and add masks, and we go here. Now we go to the real event, no masks, no ventilation, and we shorten the duration. Then we go here. So you see, nothing, nothing individually is a silver bullet. I know use ventilation I just, is not, doesn't get you out of the risk of being indoors, right? I mean, this is a very extreme case, you know, the dorms shouldn't be like this. But now, now you do all of the things. So this is what we call the layers of protection. You increase the ventilation, you have the HEPA filter, you wear the mask, percent to do all of these things, right? Now, if instead of singing, they were talking, now you're going back to the real event and they're just talking. It goes down a lot because talking, you produce five times less particles than, than singing. Now you do, you take the real event, no masks, no nothing, and you just do the choir rehearsal outdoors. You can barely see it, right? So this is, you know, this is when I gave you some exercise through Chris I mean, At the end, what you learn is if you can, and, and this doesn't depend, the evidence that outdoors is safe does not depend on whether you believe on droplets, aerosols, or fomites. Everyone agrees this is epidemiological data. People following, doing contact tracing, and seeing where people get sick. Outdoors is just very hard to get sick. Right? So anything that can be done outdoors, do outdoors. If you have to do it indoors, you have to do all these things. Limit the time, wear masks, try to do ventilation, whatever. Now you ask about the dorms, and the question is, you know, ventilation in dorms varies a lot, and in any building, we've been working with a university, and you know, it's like doing archaeology. There is some buildings that, that all you can do is open the windows and there are some new buildings that have amazing ventilation and everything in between, right? So in the buildings that are old and they have poor ventilation, they bought a lot of these HEPA filters. They actually see you, Boulder has bought a thousand HEPA filters to put in different rooms, you know? And then there are other buildings that have good ventilation, but they could tweak it and increase it. But again, you know, is it safe or unsafe? If you look at the post I will put about the CO2, you can actually measure it. It's actually a, a, an easy experiment is, I would say it's a middle school experiment, the level of difficulty or, or maybe, I mean, in fact, I've seen some science fair experiments that are more complicated than just the CO2. So with one of these CO2 analyses, you can, you can really quantify how much ventilation there is in a space. But the other way is to think of smoke, you know, light a match or, or imagine someone is smoking in one dorm room. Are you gonna smell it in the next dorm room or not? That's if you great. can, then it's not great, you know. Yeah, we'll figure out a way to do that aside from having all the undergraduates take up smoking. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm glad maybe you like, mentioned, like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Light, lighting a match, maybe the least. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so you, um, you mentioned the estimator. I want to turn to that. We had a lot of student questions about that. Uh, people really interested in it and having fun playing around with it. Also, one student wants to know, given how in the, the stadium model, 
the low transmission for 31,000 people wearing masks. Uh, they were interested in if, if you've gotten any offers from the sports or entertainment industry for <laughs> you well, doing your work. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, because once they see the fine print, so then the thing with, uh, with the estimator, and there is a lot of fine print. And what most people do is they ask me a question that is already explained in the, in the readme page and they have not read the readme page. So you have to, if you're serious, you have to read the other details. Yeah. And there is two things to know. One is, so when we go back to this slide, you can get sick in these ways. And I do believe you can get sick in all of them. We are only modeling this one through the air for someone who's far from you. But if you are close to someone, that's another risk that's not in the estimator, both because of the aerosol and, and these droplets. And if you go through surfaces, that's another risk that's not in the estimator. So when you think about the stadium, really the major problem or, or one of the things that's in the estimator is, is Donald Trump's rally in Oklahoma. It's an, an estimate, but, but really, you know, I did it the day before and I was like, do I put this on Twitter? But I was like, really it's not realistic because the problem, the problem is not this transmission in the room. The problem is they're going to be very close to each other, right? They're not respecting social distance. So they, everything that the estimator does it assumes that you respect social distance. I was actually talking to the Wall Street Journal and they want to do a version of the estimator and they really want to remove, want to include when you are close to someone, but it's a little bit of a research project. So here for now, this is all in the room. The other thing to know, you know, you do something and you say, okay, this is a class and I get a certain, this is probably the most important result. What's the probability of infection if I have one class in, in my area? And they say, well, it's, it's one in 10,000, right? So one of every 10,000 people that go to class may get infected, right? This number, we don't know it very well, right? So this thing about the motion of the air and all these things, we know pretty well, but there is one thing that we don't know very well and it's the disease. We don't know how many viruses people are exhaling, right? And that really, that is a significant number. So when I say it's 0.01, one in 10,000, that's the chance you get infected. It could really be one in a thousand. And it could really be one in a hundred thousand. It is that uncertain. So it's basically it's telling you within what we call an order of magnitude, a factor of 10, right? As we accumulate information about the disease, the same model with the same math will be better because we will know those numbers better. But right now that's what does. And you, so you have to take it with a substantial grain of salt, right? But, you know, it's still useful, right? If you say, well, going to class, maybe it's one in a thousand, but it's not a hundred percent. I know it's not a super high risk thing, and it's not the risk is not zero, right? And if I, go, if I go to the choir and I go to the equivalent number, which is this one, a choir that happens, so it's, it's half a percent. And maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 0 0.05%, but it's, you know, that, that would give me pause. I wouldn't go to a choir where I had up to a 5% chance of being infected, right? And sorry, what, how should I continue? Oh yeah, so some of the questions were things like, um, do pressure, temperature, and humidity stay constant in this? I think that you have places where you can change them, but I'm not sure if the students know like how to estimate those things, or could you talk a little bit about like how you, you can play around with this for different settings? I mean, basically, let me just maybe give a, a three minute rundown. Perfect. So the, est the estimator is, a, so there's the readme file and the FAQs, which are basically, easy information about what's there and what numbers go in there. Now we go, let's go to the classroom. And then you go to the beginning and there is, there is a bunch of numbers that you, you have to change for your situation, right? And um, here in the copy. So, so there are these, the, the size of the room and the height and whatever, I may we'll do an example. So you have to enter these numbers for you right? because these are just placeholders for, for a case, right? And now the, how long is there? How many times you do it? What's the ventilation rate? All of these things. Now there are other inputs that are kind of here in this yellow. That means that these are more, I would call them researchy specialized. Okay? And um, so I think you could assume for most, for most practical purposes, just leave the defaults. Okay? The, I, I don't think it's important enough to discuss it at this level. I think it's probably more important things to discuss. There, there's some discussion in the, in the FAQs, whatever, but I would say that's, that's more tangential. Okay? Um, but anyway, so there are these inputs and then here, how many people are there? How many people are immune? You know, if you're in New York right now, you know, this number may be 15%. And then less people can get infected because some of them are immune, right? 
and then also kind of how hard people are breathing, are people wearing masks or not, that kind of thing, and how many viruses people are putting into the air, which is a function of are they talking, are they running, are they, uh, all, these, all these numbers, and then the probability of being infected. This is a very important number, right? And this really modulates everything. If you are in Arizona right now, this number is pretty high. I don't know, I have maybe one in 200 people is contagious. So then if you go to a place that has 200 people, you have many numbers that there is someone who's infected. Now, if you are now in New York, you know, this number may be one in 3000. So if you have 200 people, it's still, you know, could it still be safe. But if there is 10 people, the chances someone is infected is very low. If you were lucky enough to be in New Zealand, then this number is zero, right? And then, or, or very low, very low. And this, then um, um, is much safer. So this modulates everything. And this changes in time with time and location. Now, what, what people have to do, and this is what the Wall Street Journal people want to do easier, but right now, you know, uh, um, I'm limited, so I've done the best I can. You have to look for each one of these numbers. You have to come here and see which number matters for you, right? And adapt, enter the numbers that matter for you and then enter it, right? So if one thing I, I could do, Chris, if you think it's a good idea, I, I could run, run through the party case. What do you think of that? I think that would be great. Thank you. Okay. So let's imagine we have a house where uh, some students do a party and how big would be the house. So let's see, it's gonna be um, a house that's maybe, a, uh, we're just gonna represent with a thousand square feet. So it would be a typical house. So the duration of the event, um, it's been a long time since I've gone to a party, but let's, let's say they're there two hours. And the students can correct me if that's, that's not the proper duration these days. Now, the number of repetitions of the event, let's say that the student goes uh, to five parties over a certain period of time, right? Because, you know, everything is online, you need to see people. Now, the ventilation rate in most houses, you know, if it's not, let's, let's, if the windows are open, it's larger, but let's say it's, it's one per hour, that would be typical, right? And they don't have any air cleaners or anything like that, so that's, that's what they have. Now, how many people are in the party? How many people can you staff in this place? Maybe we should simulate the kitchen, because at least when I used to go to parties, everyone was always in the kitchen and the rest of the house was empty. <laughs> I'm gonna assume 50 people. You guys can do around, like, probably you can staff more people in a party, but that's, it's a house of a thousand square feet and you have 50 people there. And we are gonna assume that people keep the distance. <clears throat> That's probably not a good assumption. So this is gonna give, you, give us a lower limit of how many people we get infected, okay? Um, now, let's say that, you know, I don't know what St. Louis, let me assume it's 10% of the population have had the virus, something like that. And the, you know, this is the, the briefing rate. It's probably a little high, but it doesn't matter very much. I'm gonna say they're talking quite a bit and maybe the music is loud and they're kind of shouting. So I'm gonna say, so I'm gonna make this 150, you know, that's the number. And, and of course they're not wearing masks. Nobody wants to wear a mask at a party. Um, that's not cool. And then we are in a place that, um, I don't know what it is in St. Louis, we could look it up, but let's assume it's something like that. One in 500 people is infected, right? So now you have entered everything and now all the results are in blue. Here you have some intermediate results for researchers or whatever matter, but really, there is two types of results, two numbers that, that matter a lot, and I'm gonna highlight them. One is the conditional result, and one is the absolute result. So I'm gonna highlight them and I'm gonna explain them, okay? So I'm gonna say, okay, this is one, and that color is a little too much. This one, that one, similar. And this one, I'll make it yellow. I'll make it also yellow, okay? So those two cells are, are kind of the main output. And all the other results are basically twisting around, you know, that we scientists like to do how we calculate things. Okay. But what this says, if, if you go to that party and you are unlucky enough that there is someone sick, you have a 20% chance of getting infected. And this is if you keep your distance and you don't, um, and you don't uh, touch anything infective or you wash your hands, whatever, right? This is why UNC is in trouble, right? What are, you know, and this is why I'm sure my university will be in trouble. We have done, you know, we have a thousand HEPA cleaners and the, the classrooms are gonna be really safe. But now they're gonna go to the, to the party and they're gonna all go sick and then 
you know, this is this is the reality, or not all, but but uh, the fraction of the uh, the substantial fraction of the student population that unfortunately is going to do that kind of thing, right? So and this, so we're saying there's twenty percent chance of being infected, and this is this is if they kept their distance. If they don't keep their distance, now you have to add how many people talk in close proximity to the person who's sick for 15 minutes and how many so you will have to add another five or six people right um something like that so you know out of the 50 people who were in the party we may have eight cases that's an outbreak right that's like the outbreaks they have at unc right and um you know so so that's a problem now but this is the conditional result and this is a term probably is conditional to the assumption that for sure there was someone sick right now let's say you don't know if there is someone sick there is some chance there is someone sick there is 50 people rather than the party. And we said there is one in 500 people in that student population who happens to be, to be sick, right? To have the virus. So then the chance that that, that person, um, that, that when you invite 50 friends, one of them is one of the unlucky who's sick is 10%, right? So instead of one point, instead of 19%, the, what we call the absolute probability of infection is now 1.7%, right? So it's, it's more or less a factor of 10, it's, some slight mathematical effects, but now it's two percent, right? So you're saying now I'm going to a party, and you know I'm desperate to go to a party, but I have a two percent chance of infection, right? Now remember, remember what I told you earlier. Like we think it's two percent. This is two percent. It could be that it is 02 percent, and it's, it's safer than I'm estimating here. But it could be that it's twenty percent. You know, so those are the kind of numbers we're we're facing, right? And um, did I overwrite? Can I ask, I over can, no, can I ask a, a question about that? One of the students asked specifically about the um, number for cell B51, which I think you had entered as 150. And they yeah. were saying that in cell D85, it says that the value for someone speaking loudly would be 65.1. So how are you, what does the 150? 150, that one? In, sorry, in B51. They were saying that they thought that 65.1 was the, the value for someone speaking loudly, but. Yeah, I mean, they, they, um, so you have to go to the README file and then this is the information we have, right? So you have to, so I'm, I'm kind of saying, okay, I mean, standing or light exercise because they're dancing or something, something like this. Yeah, And I'm I assuming see. That, that they're loudly speaking, that, that this, I mean, we leave, there is many students that live near us and my wife has the police on the speed dial because they are always blasting the music right and they're always yelling ah, because they don't hear because <laughs> you know so I'm, I'm thinking that so I, yeah. I, I eyeball 150 again and that this number precisely is what's very uncertain so you take right. 150 or you take 50 that's how you get um that's how you get this number to vary a factor of 10 basically because yeah. really that is number of 150 you could tell me I'm gonna put 65, and I'll tell you that's probably as good of a guess as mine. You could also right. put 250, right? Yeah, and no, that makes perfect sense, right? It's is it a relaxy party or is it a dance party? Because that's gonna impact that number. But, but, sure. but then, then the point if we compare the, the risk of in a classroom, so we're gonna say, okay, if you go to a class, your chance of infection is maybe 0.1%, if the, the way Boulder is doing the classes, you know. But now in the evening you go to a party and your chance of infection is 20%. So guess what's going to happen? And yeah. there's experimental evidence at UNC serving as guinea pigs because all the clusters are in the dorms and the fraternities, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, it's very worrying. Well, I think that this is great information to help us keep in mind how we need to be careful inside the classroom, outside the classroom. Um, so I've been asking everyone, I mean, I, I think this was wonderful and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. We only have a few minutes left. Um, but I've been asking people, you know, in addition to everything that you've already told us, is there kind of one take home message? What I'm hearing from you is stay outside as much as possible and check your mask and make sure it's fitting well. Are there any other things that you want to leave us with today? Um, I mean, pay attention. I mean, say that, uh, you know, and, and if you say, if you see something, say something, you know, if you have your friends, they're not wearing the mask, they have the mask below the nose, all these things, you know, say something politely, but, and, um, and think about the smoke really, I mean, the, or the vaping or whatever, that's really, is a great analogy. I mean, 
this, you know, I'm from Spain and it became a really, because I talk about the smoke and then now, now they're, they're banning smoking. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I meant. <laughs> I don't know if it's because of me or, or in general, but they're banning smoking because it's just, and I'm like, no, 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 it's not the smoke. The smoke is just how we can think about it, right? But think about, you know, when you are, because people are bombarded by questions is what about in daycare, which is, this, so it's like, I don't know, you know, you cannot think about every building, but think about the smoke or light a match or think about, you know, if the smoke will accumulate, that's dangerous. And, and then you wanna, you wanna avoid that. And then, I mean, and the other thing is that these layers of protection work, you know, because you see here, I mean, the classroom and the party are not that different, right? But the classroom has more ventilation, it has an air cleaner, it has fewer people and people are wearing masks and it's shorter, right? And all of those things, as we saw with the choir, each one of, none of them is the silver bullet, but when you put them together, they turn something dangerous into something that has a small risk. You know, that is it's never zero if you go indoors with other people, but it's small risk. And, and to stop the pandemic, right, um, in, you guys have all heard about the R0 and all, all these things, right? I mean, if, if one person gives it to, to one and a half, and we make that one person gives it to 0.9, we must stop the pandemic and or the other way around, right? If, the, if, if, if we give it to more cases and there's a, a few parties like in Chapel Hill and suddenly five people came in who were sick, but now we have 300. So, you know, so our, our, our individual actions really have an, can have the potential to have a big impact on, on our communities, right? That's great. Yeah, that's a perfect message. Well, thank you so very much. This was wonderful and I really appreciate you taking the time. Okay. Well, thank you, Christian. Thank you, everybody. Have a good yep. semester. You too. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs> yep. Bye.